Go ahead and uh, take a seat and open up your Bibles to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. And open up to uh, chapter 20. And we'll continue our study through this book. And remember, we're learning about the southern kingdom in Judah. And um, Israel had already been uh, taken captive. And uh, Judah is not too far behind. Um, but there, God's continuing to work with them and uh, teach them things. And, of course, we continue to see the pattern, as we have throughout this study, of good kings and bad kings and people that did what was right in the sight of the Lord, as their father David had done, and others who did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And so that pattern continues, and it's one that uh, we ever need to be reminded of because uh, we're prone that way ourselves as, as well. And um, in chapter 20, we... We went through it last week, but just by way of reminder, the thing that we saw in that chapter is um, just an example in Jehoshaphat. And um, Jehoshaphat realized that there were, gonna, there were people coming against him, uh, the people of Moab and the people of Ammon, and they had come to battle against Jehoshaphat. And we see in verse 6 that he did something, or verse 3, rather, it said, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. And such an important principle that when we are facing an enemy, when we are facing anything that uh, causes us to worry or fear, rather than going into, you know, um, self-salvation mode and trying to uh, take care of things ourselves, we see um, in these kings, more or less, uh, in their response to the Lord, we see an example of, of ourselves. And, um, and in this case, a great example from Jehoshaphat to, to seek the Lord. You know, we're going to face battles, and we're going to be afraid, and it's just part of the course in our life in a fallen world. Uh, but how do we respond? That's always the question. You know, a lot of times we can do really foolish things just simply out of fear. And, and those things reveal uh, what's in our heart. And are we trusting the Lord or are we, are we living in fear and doing things uh, foolishly and impulsively? And one of the things uh, that we see is that he remembered, they remembered who God is. Verse 6, it says... Um, are you, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hands is there not power and might so that no one's able to withstand you? So some rhetorical questions here, but so important. We have to be reminded, you know, is this not true of you? Um, we forget the things that we know about God. And in seeking the Lord, one of the things it means is, is to remember just simply who he is. Look at your problems, look at your enemies, look at your circumstances in light of not who you are and, and what you can do, but who God is and what, what he can do. And uh, they remembered what he did in the past. Verse 7, are you not our God? So are you not God over all the nations? Are you not king of the universe? And then it's real personal. Are you not, in fact, our God as well? God's not just some distant God that's sort of in charge of the universe, but he's also a very personal God. And, and it says, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. And these enemies that were surrounding them, they, it was a threat to not just their lives, but to their land their, their heritage, their, their future. And God had promised, this is your land forever. And there are certain promises that God makes to us, and they're forever. They are forever. The scripture says God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We have, doesn't matter what kind of trials we go through, doesn't matter what kind of enemies we face, uh, doesn't matter even, uh, you know, our own failures. They can have a, a 
a serious effect on our lives, but it doesn't change the faithfulness of God to keep his promise, to keep his word. He, when, when God says something and commits to something for us, it's, it's forever. I love that about the Lord. What he said he would do in the future. Verse eight and nine. And, and they dwell in it and have, have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sore, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. For your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. And so they remembered who God is. They remembered what he'd done in the past and then what he said he would do in the future. And... And they, they had to keep their eyes on him by faith. Verse 12, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. I like that. I underline that in my Bible. You know, do you ever, do you ever find yourself in a place where you honestly, you, can't, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how things are going to work out. But you just say, you know, my eyes are on you, Lord. That's all I know. <laughs> that's all I got. And it's enough. It's more than enough. But that's a great attitude, seeking the Lord. And, and you know, they also uh, learned to hear the Lord. They, they listened. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. And so God, God comes to the pro through a prophet and speaks to them. And I love this. It says, listen, verse 15, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And check this out. And you, King Jehoshaphat. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty bold guy, pretty bold prophet. You, get, you stand up to the king and say, hey, and I'm talking to you too, buddy. And you know, because even though he was king over the people, he was still under God's authority. And this man was a spokesman for God. This man was somebody who, who was speaking and they needed to listen. God always has a special word for those who turn to him for help, and when you face battle, and we all do, we are in a spiritual battle. So we, we need to spend time. You know, a lot of times people are frustrated because they don't, they don't feel like they can hear God. Sometimes they, I'll ask people that are frustrated, well, how do you think God's gonna speak? And then I'll talk about some of those things and just remind them, what are some of the ways God has chosen to speak? Well, he speaks through his word. Okay, are you reading the word? Well, no. I'm <laughs> and there's always a reason. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I don't feel like it. I don't understand it. It's confusing. There's, there's all kinds of excuses we can make for not listening to the word. But, but here's basically what that means. Okay, I've just... I've just set aside one of the means by which God can speak to me. So if I want to hear from God, it's like I've, I've just kind of turned off his voice in that area. Okay, so what's that? What, what, what's left? How else can God speak to you? Well, he could speak through prayer. Hmm. Tell me about your prayer life. Well, you know. <laughs> and not really praying, not really talking to God much. And oh, okay, well, that's another way that God has chosen to speak and can't really hear that. Any, anything else that maybe God might do to speak to you? Well, I don't know. Well, how about teachers? Does God speak to you through, you know, it might be a, a, a sermon on the radio. It might be, uh, uh, you know, at church. It might be at a Bible study or through a friend. I don't really have time for all that stuff. And okay, so I can't hear God from that area either. Any other ways God can speak? Well, Probably won't speak audibly, although sometimes he's done that. But, um, you know, I've thought there's at least one other way God speaks to me. And it's through trials. It's through sometimes chastening and discipline. Because all of the other gracious means by which God chooses to speak, I'm not listening to. And so sometimes he'll, he'll let my enemies surround me. He'll let me feel overwhelmed. He'll, you know, and I'm not saying that's the only reason that he does that, but I'm just saying that is one way God can get our attention. It's through making us feel overwhelmed, outnumbered, outgunned, surrounded. And we come to the place where we're desperate. We say, you know what? I think I'm ready to listen. <laughs> I'm all ears. I'm ready to hear from God. Oh, good. You know, God delights in, in doing things as gently as can be. 
but he also will be as firm as necessary. And, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for that, to be honest with you. I don't like it, but, you know, sometimes I bring that on myself because I'm just not listening. But in Jehoshaphat, you know, here we see in this chapter that they, they sought the Lord and they listened to the Lord. <clears throat> Another thing we saw is that they praised the Lord. This is such a cool verse. When they had consulted, verse 21, uh, it, well, verse actually, verse 20 it says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. So God's saying, hey, as long as you listen to me, you seek me and you listen to me, uh, you're gonna prosper. And, um, and then it, this cool verse, it says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. And, and the battle ended up being won by singers. They were standing in the most dangerous place of all. They literally, if you remember in the story, they were standing between two armies that were about to fight. That's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, you got two guys lined up, or two, two, two uh, armies lined up for battle, and then they got a choir in the middle of them. Oh, you know, singing. It's just like, what? That's, who does that, you know? Well, apparently God does things that way, and... And I'm, I just think it's a great picture. They sang the Lord's praises and they just routed the enemy. And it's just, it's such a great pattern, such a great picture for us. Have you ever tried that, by the way? You're going through spiritual battle and, and, and the Lord puts it on your heart or maybe a friend says, hey, you know, I, why don't you listen to this CD or why don't you just you know, spend some time in worship or you just come to church and, you know, it's been a rough week. You just come dragging in and, and, and all of a sudden in praise, in worship, it's like ah, perspective just changes everything. It's like the enemy just flees. You settle down. You're at peace and God just kind of routes the enemy and, and the battle's over. The battle's over just like that. It's a good pattern. Uh, now, some of you may be saying, oh, I don't know, I've never really had that experience. Hey, I'm telling you, stuff's in the Bible for a reason. These aren't just interesting stories. These are principles, Old Testament pictures that, that illustrate certain principles, certain truths about our life uh, with the Lord. And uh, we come into chapter, um, uh, chapter 21, and... God kept his promise to maintain David's uh, descendants on the throne of Judah, um, but he also kept his promise to discipline them. All along the way, we've heard him make both promises. And this um, uh, Jehoram is um, well, the one who was uh, king next. Okay, He was his son, Jehoshaphat's son. And... Um, and he, he had to be disciplined in a number of different ways. In chapter 21, we see some of that. And, uh, and first of all, his rule started to disintegrate because the Edomites uh, revolted and the Philistines invaded. And we're told why. It says, Jer uh, ch ch verse 5, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Okay. Not Judah, the kings of Israel. And remember, they already got their spanking and they're being dealt with. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done. For he, Check this out. He had the daughter of Ahab as a wife <laughs> and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So there's that ripple effect. Uh, we saw a lot of that drama already unfold, but, uh, but it's still kind of in the family. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because the covenant he made with David and since he promised to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. But we come into verse eight and that's where we see uh, the days of Edom, in his days Edom revolted, revolted against uh, Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. And so uh, that's kind of where it all started. And that is what happens when we don't obey the Lord. Life just kind of starts to fall apart. And, um, and basically, he went back into the idolatry. Verse 11, made high places in the mountains of Judah, caused the inhabitants of Israel to commit harlotry and led Judah astray. But again, God's mercy, God's grace sends a prophet. Who's the prophet? You'll recognize this one. Elijah, 
Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Father David, Because you've not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot, like the harlotry of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brothers. First thing he did when he became king is he killed all the other brothers. Why do you think he did that? Because he didn't want any of them usurping his authority and take, ascending to the throne. It was actually a fairly common thing to do in the ancient world is, you know, get rid of any potential threats. Not a lot of family loyalty. Uh, when it came to the throne, everybody wanted the piece of the throne. And so, um, but it certainly wasn't uh, something that uh, pleased the Lord. And so things start to fall apart. And, and God speaking through Elijah says, verse 14, Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and all your possessions, and you will become very sick with a disease of your intestines until your intestines come out by reason of sickness day by day. Huh, that's kind of gross. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's really gross. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And uh, so everything that God said basically happened. And, you know, here again, though, God had given him a, an opportunity to repent. You know, God sends his prophets. God puts people in our life to come along and say, hey, and give warnings and, and, and let us know. And, and what a privilege, what a display of God's mercy. And yet this guy died in, in just a terrible way, severe pain. And, and look at this, verse 20. How'd you like this to be your epitaph? He was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow, he departed. <laughs> like nobody, nobody cared when he died. That's a terrible legacy. But that was, that was the son. That was the son of the great Jehoshaphat. And um, man, good reminder, listen to the warnings, listen to the warnings of God. Now we come into uh, chapter 22, and Ahaziah, or Ahaziah, Ahaziah the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned, 42 years old when he became king, reigned one year in Jerusalem. Not a real long reign. How come? His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Imagine a mother teaching her son how to sin. You know, moms, that's not why you're moms. <laughs> Mommies are supposed to teach good things. And, oh, man. I, I will tell you, and, and this is just by way of encouragement. I think that my, this is probably, probably because I was raised by a single mom. Um, moms are pretty hard on themselves. And, and most moms I know feel like in some measure they have failed. Um, even the best moms, you know, you just always feel in some measure like you could do more or you're falling short. And sometimes there could be a lot of heartbreak and a lot of pain. You look back and you realize, man, I, I did teach my kids to sin. I, I did do some things that really didn't represent the Lord and I wasn't a Christian and I, I just lived a, you know, a sinful life. And I just want to encourage you, it is never too late. Well, I can't say never. I mean, there is a point where it's too late. If you just are stubborn and resist the Lord your whole life. But, you know, my mom, for my mother, it was her sister. Her sister led her to the Lord and prayed for her for years. She calls her sister St. Joanne. <laughs> and, and they're just best buddies today. But uh, Joanne uh, was married years ago. He, he, he's with the Lord now. But my uncle Russell, um, he was a pastor. And, and he was, when, when my mom got saved, um, we started going to church, and that was the first church we went to. It's an old Christian Missionary Alliance church, just a little, little church. They met in the high school, just like we used to meet in the high school. And I just was mesmerized watching my uncle preach. And, and I think that's where the Lord put the seeds in my heart to say, I want to do that. I want to be a preacher someday. You know, and I wasn't really close to my uncle Russell. I just, I just watched him. You know, and, and it just, there's something about it that resonated with me. I thought, I want to teach the Bible, you know. But, you know, and I'm so thankful that my mom 
listened to the influence of the people God put into her life. You know, she, she listened to a lot of the wrong influences for a lot of years. And, and you know, and, and she's, she's pretty hard on herself, you know. She looks back and she feels like, you know, I was one of those moms that taught my kids how to sin. But, you know, uh, she, she also led me to the Lord. And, and she taught me how to walk with the Lord. And when I think of my mom today, I don't think of, I don't think of, the things that she thinks of. I don't think of the mistakes and stuff. I mean, I know she made them, but that's not what I think about. I just think, man, I'm so glad she listened to God's messengers. It was, and she didn't think, oh, it's too late for me. You know, I can't, um, you know, I've already, I've, I've made too many mistakes. I've blown it for too many years and, you know, it's just too late for me. And You know, she had a lot of learning, a lot of growing, uh, and even some more sinning to do, you know. It took a, a, some more mistakes along the way, even as a Christian. She still did a lot of things that, that she regretted because it took a long time for those habits to change. But she learned to listen to God. She learned to listen to messengers from God, you know, those godly people that were put into her life. And I'm so glad she didn't end up being an Athaliah, somebody who just continued to teach her son the wrong things, but she learned to teach good things. And I, I, I owe her a great debt. I owe her a great debt. I'm really thankful uh, that she did that. I just say that as a personal testimony just to encourage you moms because I, I, I do know that on the one hand, there are warnings in Scripture of, of people that just are bent on living in wickedness, but you have to realize that there's also stories in Scripture of people that maybe started out that way, but they didn't finish that way because God in His mercy continued to reach out to them, and you, and you always have a choice. You know, you can say, you know what, enough's enough. I'm done. I'm not running from God anymore. I'm not living that way anymore. I'm going to surround myself with godly people. I'm going to get into the word. I'm going to, I'm going to submit to the Lord and let him fix my brokenness and heal my heart and teach me new things. And, and it's never too late for that. And I know a lot. And I know a lot. Some of you are here. I know a lot of moms who have a very similar story in this church as to the one I've shared with my mom. And I admire you guys too, you ladies too, because I know it hasn't been an easy road for you, but man, it is so worth it to let the Lord turn things around and pass on new things to the next generation. Amen? That is just, I love that God can do that. And um, so this gal, Athaliah, she's kind of, She's kind of like an Old Testament version of Herodias. Remember Hero Herodias in the New Testament? She's the one that uh, had John the Baptist beheaded. Just a wicked lady. You can read about, well, I don't know why you want it, but anyway, she's there. <laughs> Matthew 14, but uh, she was so much the opposite. And then you see a contrast. You see godly Hannah, <clears throat> you know. Hannah, you know, was dealing with difficult things in her life too, but man, she... She submitted to the Lord. And uh, the crazy thing is, is Athaliah, her son dies. He only reigns for one year. And she actually ascends to the throne because remember all the sons had been killed. So, so she was it. She was, it. she was like a form of judgment really on the nation because they had been so wicked and all this had happened. Um, they got left with her. She was all they had. And um, so... Uh, but here's the cool thing. Um, God had another woman in the picture, a godly woman. And I want you to, I want to introduce you to her. And if you look at verse uh, 10, now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Jehoshaphat, Okay, these names are so hard. Jehoshabeath, the daughter of the king, okay, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeath, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Ahaziah, Athaliah reigned over the land. 
That's a crazy story, man. They're killing all the boys, all the, the potential heirs to the throne. And this, this, this one gal just makes the most heads up move. And she says, not this boy. She takes Joash and she hides him away. And, um, and for six years, they hid this little guy and, um, in, the, in the house of God. Probably not a place she was going to frequent, I guess. <laughs> Let's hide him at church. She won't go there. And uh, that was a good plan. Good plan. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of the hundreds. And so what happened is some other people, the priests and, and, and all the godly folk got together on this little plan. And they said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We are going to protect this boy. And they literally, this, this, this kid had armed guards around him 24-7. They didn't let anybody come near him. And for six years, they protected him. And they eventually made him, made him king. And um, it's, it's just really an amazing story. We come into chapter uh, 24, and here we have Joash. And uh, he was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And here we are, verse 2, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Isn't that interesting? Notice it didn't say all the days of his life. All the days of Jehoiada the priest. This was the one who protected him. This was his mentor. And, uh, and he did well. He, he learned as long as godly Jehoiada was on the scene, the king obeyed the Lord, the temple prospered. I love it. Verse four, now it happened after this, it, uh, now it happened after this that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. That's a good thing to do, great thing to have a heart for. So he gets everybody together. He gathers, is, he gathers the, the, the priests and Levites together, and uh, he gathers money from Israel. He gets people on board, casts his vision for, for basically repairing God's house. <laughs> and, uh, and they do. They, everybody gets on board with it. And, um, and he says, and see that you do it quickly. I like that phrase. I underline that too in my Bible because, you know, um, the church had fallen into disrepair in those days and, and, and everything it represented, people's relationship with God was in disrepair. And I often tell people that though it's true, it, it, we are, it, it does take a lifetime for us to grow. God's working in our lives the whole way along. And some things, some areas of our life just seem to take longer than others to really see fruit and, and we've got to be patient with that. But I often tell people, you know, if you are really fully surrendered to the Lord and you have a spiritual appetite and you get into the Word and you get into fellowship and, and you just apply yourself to godliness... I'm not saying make yourself godly. Only the Lord can do the work. It's a work of the Lord. But apply yourself to cooperating with the Lord. I often tell people, you just might be surprised how fast you grow. How fast things turn around. I, I just, he says, get out there and do it and do it quickly. And, and I just think it's really important as a principle in, in the Christian life. There's things, those areas of disrepair. See, one of the reasons, and we're going to see this in the story tonight, one of the reasons God's people struggled is half-heartedness, half-hearted commitment. You know, got one foot in the world and one foot in church. It's just kind of this double-mindedness, this divided heart. And this is why there's so much carnality in the church today is because we're not interested in being all in with God and doing it quickly in the, in the sense of, a, like, we have a sense of urgency. I want to apply myself to that. I don't want to put it off for another year or five. I want to get right down to this. If you, if you haven't made certain uh, spiritual disciplines a priority in your life, then you just, you can't expect to see growth. I don't mean go out there and try harder. I'm not, I'm not saying that in a fleshly way. You just got to try harder. Um, it, it's different. I, I'm just saying, maybe I'm trying to say just surrender more and, and, 
And you might be surprised what God can do pretty quickly in your life. It, it just, are you available? Are you surrendered? Are you willing? Are you cooperating? And um, so, uh, if, you, if you, now, I said, I brought attention to the fact that as long as Jehoiada was around, if you lean, we do need each other. And it's good to, to um, encourage one another and, and in a sense depend on one another and in, in the sense that uh, you gotta take some risks. Some people are afraid to fellowship. They're afraid to open up and be real. They're afraid to share life with other people because they might get let down. Well, you gotta take some risks. You gotta, you gotta be willing to open up in order to grow. But having said that, don't, lean too much on other people where you're depending on them to prop you up in your faith. Um, because when those people are gone, you fall. And guess what? They will be gone at some point. Have, how many of you have noticed people come and people go <laughs> in the Christian life? I, I'll tell you, I, as a pastor, I've seen so many people come and go. Sometimes for perfectly you know, good reasons. In other words, they're not leaving because there's something wrong with the church or their relationship. It's just God moves them on someplace else. Sometimes they do leave for the wrong reasons. Um, but people come and people go. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why we should redeem the time. Hey, listen, take a lesson from people in the military. I have watched over the years, whenever a military a, a strong Christian military family comes into our church. Do you know what I see them do? Oh, man. They just, they like, okay, where can I serve? What can I do? How can I get involved? And, and they hit the deck running. Why? Because they've learned that as a way of life. Because they know I'm only going to be here for so long. And God's, you know, I'm going to be moving in another two, three, four years. And so they just get down, roll up their sleeves, get busy, connect, serve. They're just, it's kind of, I, I just think it's a great model. I think, why don't we all learn something from our military families? Uh, I think we, we fall into the apathy and the snare, the, the, the lie that, oh, there's plenty of time. You got plenty of time. I'll get to that next year. You know, I'll start serving in the church next year. I'll start giving to the Lord's work next year. I'll start doing this. Summer. And we put it off, put it off, put it off. And I, 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 God bless my military brothers and sisters. And I learned so much from them over the years because they just, they just come in and say, hey, how can I get involved? And they learn to form relationships quickly. Not superficially, by the way. They can be, they can be substantive, deep friendships. But they're They're committed. They, they have a, a clear purpose and a clear vision because it's required. And, and I wish we had more of that mindset. It's so biblical. Why? Because we're in a spiritual battle. And people that as a, as a way of life, as a career, they have a battlefield mentality, they redeem the time. And, and people that have a civilian mentality, they tend, they tend not everybody, of course, but it's easy to get sort of into this false sense of security and I got plenty of time and that's just not true. That's not the way God wants us to live. And so um, I just, I love this. Whatever you do, do it, he says, uh, this, this task he gave them to do, he said, do it quickly. And then it says, however, the Levites did not do it quickly. <laughs> So the king, he didn't give up though. Check this out, what a leader. So the king called Jehoiada, the chief priest, and said to him, why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and from uh, Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of assembly of Israel for the tabernacle of witness? So he held them to account. He says, hey, what's the problem here? <laughs> what's hanging up the show? Come on, let's go. And he was, he was a leader. He was a motivator. And he got him going. And um, so just great great leader and um, and we come into chapter I'm going to jump ahead I took longer on that point than I wanted to so um, Joash ends up dying uh, sadly um, he didn't finish well he was another one of those that started well but didn't finish well and um, 
So he dies, come into chapter 25. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadon of Jerusalem and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So again, that's the good news. What's the bad news? But not with a loyal heart. <laughs> Just like I was saying, half-heartedness. It's always a, a tough thing. Amaziah was half-hearted in his religious life, not loyal to the Lord. Instead of trusting God for victory, uh, we find that he hired some men. Verse 6, he hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim, but if you go, be gone, be strong in battle. Even so, God shall make you fall before the enemy, for God has power to help and to overthrow. So he starts, you know, thinking, well, I got to do something. And so he's going to bring in hired men. And um, it wasn't a good plan. Uh, Amaziah said to the man of God, what shall we do? What shall we do about the hundred talents, which I've given to the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, Verse 9, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. So he, um, he, they were going to war against Edom, and he decided to hire help from the outside rather than to trust the Lord. And the man of God came and said, uh, don't do that. You're, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to help you. Basically, you're going to be fighting against God. And, and all he can think about was the money. Well, but what about the money? I've already hired him. And you know, when you start measuring your obedience against temporal things, stuff like money, you are not living by faith. Matthew 6, what's it say? Seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. God will take care of all that stuff. But what about the money, he said? When you start asking yourself, is it profitable rather than is it right? You got a problem. You got a serious problem. He kind of argued with God, but, but he did finally obey. And, um, you know, and then the army, they got ticked off. He'd hired this army. And you say, well, why would they be upset? Uh, you know, they got their money. And the reason is because they wanted to go to war so they could get the spoils. They wanted more money. So they were upset. They were upset about this. But we all know that stuff never, never satisfies. Um, well, anyway, he ended up not listening to, to the man of God and uh, even threatened to kill him. And then he finally died. And, and so he lived for the wrong values and got the wrong counsel. And he ended up basically dying a failure. And um, that just reminds me, God is seeking this wholehearted devotion to him. Uh, chapter 26 um, this is where we see King Uzziah. That name sound familiar? All the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. And Uzziah was 16 years old and reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, verse 4, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And then down in verse 8, his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt for he became exceedingly strong. And then verse 15, the end of verse 15, so his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. <laughs> you see a little foreshadow there? And now here it comes. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Man, that's a pretty intense thing again. 
going toe to toe with the king. And they, they gave him the what for? They put him in his place. He said, get out. You're the king and we know that, but we also know you are not the priest and you're messing with God. You are treading on thin ice here, buddy. And so the starting, we see the starting point of Uzziah's success was the fact that he sought God and he did God's will and he wanted to. And um, unlike his, his dad, he was, he was wholly given to the Lord. Remember, his dad was half-hearted. He was whole-hearted. But even though that was true, he was still just a man, and he still was vulnerable to pride like we all can be. And he had a great starting point, but there was also this turning point. In verse 16, he got lifted up in his own pride, became uh, started listening to his own press a little too much. He became famous. He became strong. God helped him wonderfully, but he couldn't handle success. And if God's blessings don't humble us, they will destroy us. Have you seen that principle to be true in your own life? If it, we've got to stay humble. If if you're richly blessed in in you know, how, whatever that means for you, whatever that looks like for you. It might be your health, it might be your wealth, it might be relationships, it might be your career, it, it might be so many things, it might be your ministry, and, and you're just wonderfully blessed of God. That should humble you to the extreme. Me? Why would God choose me? Why would God do that for me? Well, it's not because you deserve it or I deserve it. It's just such a humbling thing that God's so gracious to us. It is true that man's pride will bring him low. The Proverbs speak much about this. And so we see the starting point and the turning point, but sadly, there's also a finishing point. Notice verses 19 to 21. Uzziah became furious and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense and while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar and Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests looked at him and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm in trouble because the Lord had struck him. Verse 21 King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. That'd be a sad thing. Can't go to church anymore. Man, you blew it. I mean, that would just be a terrible thing. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house judging the people of the land. Hmm. So that's how he finished. He wasn't content. He wasn't humble, he wasn't content. Content to just be king, he had to be priest too. He didn't respect the boundaries God had established. And so God sort of shrunk his world. And um, you know, there's great freedom in obedience. There's great freedom in humility. There's great freedom in contentment. When you, when you start to say, I want, I want more, it's like you get less content, less satisfied, and, and you start making bad decisions, and your world just, it just shrinks. And uh, he didn't, when I think of Uzziah, I realize how subtle it was. He didn't sin like some of his forefathers in really blatant ways. You know, he didn't go into idolatry. He didn't commit great acts of wickedness. And yet, you look at Satan and how he fell. How did he fall? Pride. Pride. How did Adam and Eve fall? <laughs> Discontent. Hey, that looks good. I think I want that. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing. He sinned in the realm of even of spiritual things. He was at church when he did this. He got carried away in pride. That's a very humbling thing. I'll tell you right now, for me as a pastor, I, I, I pray constantly, Lord, just 
Keep me small in my own eyes. I, just don't ever let me shame your name. I, I feel so bad and so sc- scared for celebrity pastors. I can't imagine carrying that kind of a burden. I thank God for those who have, a, um, that are faithful and they have a, a, a far-reaching ministry. But it, it's a rare man that can do that faithfully for a lifetime. Isn't that true? There's not many Billy Grahams out there. You know, there, there's just not. We just don't know what to do with power and glory and and we tend to take it and drink it in and it's such a dangerous thing And, and, and even doing spiritual things we can we can totally blow it and you know and and the Bible's replete with examples look at look at Moses you know, he just had this stellar record for so long and he put up with a lot of guff. Can you, would you like to guide two or three million complainers through the desert for 40 years? I, I wouldn't. It takes everything in me to just deal with the complainers I got. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got a small little flock I can't imagine having a great big flock. He was kept out of the promised land because of pride. What about Joshua? Followed in his footsteps, great man. (laughs) Joshua was a great man of God. Great exploits, victorious for the Lord in so many different ways. But you remember that story? They came into the promised land and it just... Jericho came down and they were just, bam, they were just just smashing the enemy's teeth. And then, you know, they were always seeking the Lord. Lord, do we go up to battle? Do we want, to, do you want us to take this city? Lord, what do you want us to do? Just tell us. We'll do it. We'll trust you. But all of a sudden, it was like they didn't need to pray anymore. Ah, there's a, yeah, hey, let's just go take it. Wait a minute. You didn't ask God. <laughs> you know, and pride. Didn't seek God's will. Got their little heinies kicked. Oh, that's right. We do need the Lord. And, and look how quick it happened. They didn't have a whole ton of victories under their belt. <laughs> they had Jericho. You know, and how quickly all of a sudden they get inflated and full of themselves. Man, we got to be careful. What about Nebuchadnezzar? Do you know, he got turned into an animal. He was eating grass like a cow for seven years. <laughs> that's weird. It's just weird. Hey, it reminds me of a joke I came up with today. You guys want to hear my joke? So I was doing this, so I was doing this uh, devotional at Northwest Christian High School. And I'll finish with this. I'm almost done. Don't worry. I'm not going to hold you forever. So, so I was doing this uh, devotional. And I was, I was <laughs> I'm so tickled with myself. If, so I was so, so, <laughs> amen. So, so I, uh, I was going, and I was praying about this, and I, was, and I was talking about, I was doing a devotional on um, words, on the tongue. I wanted to talk to these young people, these high schoolers, about how important our words are. And um, I told them this funny story about when I was a children's ministry pastor years ago, and I had a chance to go to Germany and, and, and Ziegen, at Calvary Chapel Ziegen, and I was going to do some, encourage and equip the uh, Sunday school teachers there. And I was talking about... Um, object lessons and how to use them with kids and how important it is to use illustrations and object lessons. And so there I was in Germany and, and I, I had came up with this idea to use a cow's tongue to teach the tongue is a fire and in James 3. And so I went out and bought a cow's tongue and I doused it in rubbing alcohol and I flopped it over the desk and I lit that bad boy on fire. <laughs> And all of these stoic Germans just were just sitting there the whole time. And then that happened. And they were like, <gasps> it was the funniest thing ever. So, so I'm telling this story. And I'm talking about how when you're doing object lessons, you got to be careful that the object doesn't upstage the lesson. You know, because then they go away just remembering that. And they don't remember your point, you know. So that's what I was trying to convey. And I was, just did it better than I wanted to. And, um, 
And so I learned later that I actually offended them because they, they considered it so wasteful. Like, you know, cow's tongue's like a delicacy, I guess. I had no idea. Who knew? In Southeast Asia, maybe, but I wouldn't have considered it in Germany. I just, it didn't occur to me. So, so I'm telling this joke to the kids. And um, I said, it's a delicacy. And I said, by the way, what do you, what do you get uh, when you order a cow tongue sandwich at Subway? I said, I said, a deli kissy. Because I had just told them, <laughs> I had just told them that cow's tongue Eating cow's tongue is kind of like kissing a cow. And so I, I just, this hit me. It was a moment of brilliance. I just said, I said, so what do you get when you cross the deli with a cow's tongue? Delicacy. Okay, anyway. <sighs> Didn't work. It's no good. <laughs> this is what you call a crash landing of the plane, folks. So, <laughs> oh, all right. Why don't you stand with me? Let's get out of here. Lord, we are thankful for your word. And um, Lord, we're just thankful to be able to learn together and grow together. Lord, I pray for us as a church that um, we would be growing um, to be more like Christ who humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. And that example of servanthood and humility and just putting others first. I pray, Lord, would you please do that in each one of us? Make us a, a people that, Lord, are great, not because of us, but just because of the character of Christ in us, that we can do great things for you because we're usable, because we're not full of pride and self-sufficiency, but we're just small in our own eyes and we're content and we're humble and just happy to see you be lifted up and your kingdom grow. And Lord, that's what we need, that's what we want. And um, Lord, I pray that we would learn our lessons quickly, that we could grow more quickly, um, but in the sense that we are just willing, that we're willing to cooperate with you. And uh, Lord, I pray for those, and including myself, in areas where maybe we feel discouraged and we've failed a lot. Um, we're thankful for your mercy and grace. And, and I just pray that you'd help us to keep in mind um, that you won't forsake us. And, and we shouldn't give up. We should, we should persevere knowing that uh, nothing will separate us from your love. And we pray as we go from here tonight that... Uh, we would just be encouraged and remain faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.